people of Ambrun Island. Pastor Uncle Ray is a director of Bungie Consultancies, a community chaplain, and an executive on the Indigenous Peoples Organisation. He is also a consultant and senior policy advisor for Bomaderry Aboriginal Children's Home and a founding member of the Coloured Digger Project, among many other roles. Thank you, Pastor Uncle Ray. Um, Pastor Uncle Ray, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. you. Might just be on mute. Thank you. I was. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'll try again. I hope everyone can hear me again. I just wanted to say, first of all, that I'm so uh, honoured to be a part of your discussions today on such an important issue like climate change and how that's affecting all of our peoples right across the planet, but it's also affecting our land. And so I just want to say that I'm holding in my hand here a piece of the soil from whose lands I now live on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Glebe. I acknowledge the wisdom and knowledge, wisdom, knowledge and expertise of the Gadigal ancestors and their custodianship of these lands that I now call my home. I acknowledge and recognize their ancestors whose wisdom have cared for this land for, for millennia. And from this soil, I recognize and acknowledge the families and children of the Gadigal clan who lived and celebrated and communed together in these lands. I also acknowledge and recognize all the blood that was shed on these lands, either in violence or in innocence. I acknowledge and recognize the elders who have come recently, who have toiled and died on these lands and left us a legacy that all people can enjoy the benefits of their labor on this soil today. I also acknowledge the responsibility I have now in stewarding and caring for these lands. This responsibility now rests on my shoulders. My responsibility is to care for the land and soil upon which I now live so that our children's children can celebrate and enjoy the fruits of this soil so that they too can live a healthy, prosperous and happy life on the land and soil of the Gadigal people. I also acknowledge and recognize that collective responsibility that we all have to care for all the lands and soils we have the honor to be birthed upon, to live upon, to play upon and to work upon. And so let's affirm our connection to the lands we now live and work upon. Let's acknowledge our elders who have worked on these lands for our benefit. And let's pledge too that we will steward the land according to the wisdom, knowledge and expertise that we now possess so that we too can pass on to our children's children the best that our land can provide for them and their children's children. And let us also undertake together the important task to care for our mother earth so that our future generations are not robbed or deprived of their rightful inheritance that is our responsibility to pass on to them so that they can enjoy the same entitlements and benefits that we have enjoyed on these lands that we all call our home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Uncle Ray. We're very grateful for your welcome to country and for grounding us so beautifully and with so much wisdom. Now, just a few housekeeping matters. If you haven't already, could you please introduce yourself in the chat, stating your name, role, organisation, and the country that you are on, the name of the traditional owners of the land. Please also add, if you haven't already, your name and organisation to your Zoom, like, Zoom name. Now, we have another slide on some housekeeping. If you could just take a few moments to 
<coughs> have a look at the um, housekeeping advice. So first of all, if you could please mute your microphones while not speaking and leave your video on wherever possible. Please use the chat to comment throughout the discussions. Unfortunately, we won't have time for questions during the roundtable, but you can email millie.burgess at kaha.org.au if you would like to follow up with any questions for speakers or the working group. And the links to the slides, I believe, are in the chat now. Um, we are recording the session and we encourage you to please live tweet the dis discussion or if you would like to do some tweeting afterwards using the hashtag climate health roundtable. And after the event, please hop on to Twitter and have a look at the hashtag and do some retweeting from other people. Helps get the word out. So I would now like to welcome Lisa Cliff to tell us about Better Futures Australia. Lisa is working with the Climate Action Network Australia to lead the Better Futures Australia initiative, engaging a broad range of organisations to collectively plan and deliver a national Better Futures forum and positively influence the international climate negotiations. Previously, she has worked with the Climate Reality Project, the Queensland Conservation Council and the ACT government, where she had the opportunity to develop climate mitigation and adaptation policy, facilitate sustainability improvements and contribute to building a world leading low carbon economy supported by an informed and empowered community. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Melissa, and thank you all for being here today. It's great to see so many uh, friendly faces and uh, there's, there's nothing like being in a virtual room of like-minded individuals. I have a few sh slides uh, to share, so I'll just get those up for you all. Uh, can everyone see that okay? Great, okay, so as, uh, as Melissa mentioned, I'm the Program Manager for Better Futures Australia with Climate Action Network Australia. And this is a new initiative uh, supported by dozens of partner organizations, including the, those behind the health sector working group uh, that, that uh, we've just heard about. So uh, I, I am calling in from Mianjin, Brisbane, and wish to pay my respects to elders past, present and future and recognize sovereignty of these uh, Yuggera and Turrbal lands was never ceded. Uh, so, Better Futures Australia is an initiative. It's not an organisation or a, a new climate action campaign. Rather, it's working to uh, connect the existing alliances and climate action initiatives and organisations that are doing great climate work to bring them all together to look at how we can uh, collectively recognise that we need everyone across all walks of life uh, to realise the opportunities of a zero emissions future. Uh, and that includes looking at how we can work alongside and in partnership with government leadership across all levels. So Better Futures Australia is working to offer a platform that all Australians can own from all corners of society and the economy to look at those zero emissions futures uh, in their context. And through the Better Futures Australia community that we're building, we're not only working to demonstrate the readiness and expectation of all Australians, for a national ambitious climate response, but also working to build and create the sense of safety in numbers that's needed for those big banks and corporations and health institutions and subnational governments to really step up and collectively call for the response we know we need from our federal government and the messages and plans that we would like them to take to those international climate negotiations come November in Glasgow. So how we do this, uh, we're working to build on the momentum currently underway. We, we are all still feeling the impacts of the fires we had over 2019, 2020, the recent floods and the increasing frequency of extreme weather events that we're already feeling, along with the health implications from a changing climate. We've seen a response from this across Australia, every state and territory now committed to net zero emissions by 2050. Many of Australia's investors and big businesses also adopting plans and voicing support for a transition to a zero emissions economy. And we're also seeing our government, the Australian government, ignoring calls again and again for the credible national long-term climate policy. 
with politicization and the divisiveness of climate creating a toxic partisan culture. So through Better Futures Australia, by working together and reaching beyond the traditional climate movement to bring in those non-traditional voices, we are working to shine the spotlight on those Australian actors, including those amazing individuals across Australia's healthcare sector, to show that net zero emissions, the transition there is already happening, and to publicly commit and demonstrate, as well as leverage the international diplomacy around key moments like COP26, to basically uh, collectively undermine our current uh, federal government's resistance to doing what is necessary and have the coherent and cohesive voice of all Australians communicating that as a country, we know we need to be doing a lot more and we can do a lot more to reach net zero as quickly as possible. And this will work also to remove any excuses standing in the way of our Prime Minister and the delegation from DFAT going to Glasgow with a credible long-term national climate policy and an updated nationally determined contribution for that 2030 emission reduction goal. Uh, so as Melissa introduced uh, with the Health Working Group, we have the excellent co-conveners from the Climate and Health Alliance Doctors for the Environment Australia, the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine, uh, the uh, New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association, uh, and did I say Australasian College for Emergency Medicine, uh, as Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association, and, and many others that are participating in those conversations, uh, including the recent edition of the George Institute that's really exciting to see how we can work across sectors with representatives from other organisations to look at where the opportunities are to work across the three pillars that are holding up the Better Futures Australia community, working to engage, so empower, educate and raise awareness around where the opportunities are, where we can exchange knowledge and ideas and where we can collectively work together to normalise ambitious climate action across Australia. Uh, so the George Institute, Institute, for instance, has, has come to the table with opportunities for looking at nutrition and food and water security in the Pacific and, and working on solutions there. Where we can scale action too. Uh, so that's the second pillar, looking at where those opportunities are and where action is already happening across society and the economy. So for instance, with uh, the, the great work of the co-conveners of this working group to put forward the global roadmap to decarbonize the health sector, how can we adopt that and map out with the relevant stakeholders what working towards a decarbonised healthcare sector in Australia by 2030 looks like. So bringing in those players through the Beyond Zero Emissions 1 Million Jobs Plan, uh, as well as local councils and cities, state and government players, uh, energy, transport and other actors, the built environment sector is a big one definitely for the health sector. How can we work collaboratively to map out what that roadmap looks like in practice and present that as a proposal to our decision makers to show it is achievable and we, we need a few uh, areas of support in order to do that. And then the third pillar, jointly advocate. So how can we uh, coordinate and collaborate around those key moments, like our own Better Futures Forum in August, as well as the Glasgow COP26 and other international and national events to call for the changes we need for realizing these zero emissions opportunities. So through 17th to 19th of August, we'll be hosting a virtual Better Futures Forum to create a national moment and launch a platform for Australian healthcare institutions, companies, investors, local, state and territory governments, farmers, industry bodies, uh, organisations and others to publicly express their commitment to more ambitious climate action. And the diversity of business and industry leaders and subnational actors will come together to converge and share a coherent message uh, that they support ambitious climate action. They'll showcase and celebrate where the achievements are happening and inspire further action across the economy and also work to engage decision makers to support the actions that will deliver those zero emissions opportunities and healthy climate resilient and better futures for us all. And this will demonstrate the readiness across all corners of society and the economy that Australians are ready for an ambitious national response and influence our government's position on climate for the UN Climate Conference this November. So through Better Futures Australia, the goal really is to restore hope that we can, by working together, both influence our federal government 
and ensure they are a positive influence in those international negotiations, but also demonstrate that we are ready by showing where the action is underway and scale those solutions to show it is achievable. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much, Lisa. I would not now like to welcome Professor Tony Capon, who will talk on the latest science on climate change and health. Tony directs the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and holds a chair in planetary health in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. He was a member of the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. A public health physician, Tony's research focuses on urbanization, sustainable development and human health. His career spans the local as Director of Public Health and Medical Officer of Health in Western Sydney to the global as Director of the International Institute for Global Health at United Nations University. Tony currently co-chairs the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action Network. Thank you, Tony. Great, thanks very much, Melissa. And thanks, uh, Uncle Ray, for getting us started uh, today. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners uh, here on Wurundjeri country um, in East Melbourne and uh, uh, their elders um, past, present and future. So I'm conscious that I've only got a short time today just to give you a bit of an overview of where we're up to in our understanding of climate and health in Australia. And I wanted to start with some images from the 2019-2020 fire season here in Australia. This image from Malakuta in Far Eastern Victoria, people sheltering on a beach. This from Sydney, where the Sydney uh, was shrouded uh, in bushfire smoke for weeks. And Melbourne, and of course, uh, our national capital, where people were wearing masks well before we were using those masks to prevent the pandemic. And this is what people saw around the world uh, in that summer. Headlines from media across the world making clear that the climate has already changed here in Australia and it's having major health impacts. Now, many of you will know that Australia is fortunate that Tony McMichael uh, was an Australian environmental epidemiologist, the first epidemiologist in the world uh, to focus his research on health impacts of climate change. And this was a schema uh, for these health impacts that I'll just spend a moment on here. You've got climate change on the left, health impacts on the right, and you can see three broad categories. Those direct impacts, like we've seen in those photos, uh, heat waves, floods, fires, storms, water shortages. The second category, uh, indirect, system mediated impacts, we can divide this into three broad categories. Uh, the changes to physical systems and processes. An example here is urban air pollution, uh, where we see uh, uh, enhanced risk on hot days, for example, in major cities because of higher levels of ozone formation at the ground level. Uh, changes to biological processes and timing, the second subcategory there, and mosquito uh, abundance and distribution is an emblematic example there. And the third subcategory of these indirect impacts is the broader changes to ecosystem structure and function uh, constraints on microbes, uh, a very current example in the context of spillover. Uh, of novel pathogens uh, from uh, wild animals to domestic animals to people. And then on the right there, you can see that third major category of health impacts of climate change, the flow on effects via social, economic and demographic disruptions. Uh, we 
refer to social determinants of health uh, in our public health work. Uh, this includes things like the impact of climate on livelihoods, loss of livelihoods in this context, and what that means for people's health, for example. And not just physical health, but also mental health. Farmers, for example, in the context uh, of prolonged drought, the impacts on their incomes and uh, community viability and uh, mental health and well-being. So uh, a lot going on there. I find that schema is actually quite useful to keep this set of big questions uh, alive in my mind. Now, uh, when I came back from uh, UN University in 2016, uh, we were fortunate to win funding from the New South Wales government to establish uh, a knowledge node on human health and climate change. And you can see here uh, on the New South Wales government website some dot points of some of the projects, uh, the research projects that were funded under that program. Uh, work, of course, on heat related mobility and mortality. Uh, other research in the context of extreme weather, including floods in northern New South Wales, for example, including the mental health impacts there, uh, increases in water and foodborne disease, uh, these vector-borne disease questions, air pollution and uh, mental health. And with uh, Sinead Boylan and colleagues, uh, we developed a conceptual framework for understanding climate change and health in this New South Wales context, but it's equally relevant across the country and in other contexts. And I won't go into it in detail here, but it's based on the WHO Dipsia uh, approach with driving forces on the left there, uh, ecological pressures, the impacts on the state of the environment, and then the specific exposures uh, for people and the health impacts on the right. This helps us uh, when we're reaching across policy domains uh, to make the connections between people in the health systems and other parts of policy uh, so that we can collaborate to take action. And the Medical Journal of Australia has actually been very helpful. The current uh, editor-in-chief, Nick Talley, from the University of Newcastle, invited me to join the editorial advisory board to help ensure that we had more focus on this in the journal. And uh, we're doing annual themed issues, as well as um, uh, we developed the MJA Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change, uh, now co-led by Ying Zhang uh, from the University of Sydney and Paul Beggs uh, from Macquarie University. You can see other collaborators there in the list on the left-hand side. So we're now up, uh, uh, that was the first uh, report back in 2018. We had a 2019 one and then more recent, the most recent one where we focused on lessons from the Black Summer where I started uh, this presentation. Some of the data, some of the, the indicators that we're tracking uh, through the MJA Lancet countdown, you can see here the heat exposure vulnerability index for the Australian population from 1919 to 2017, and you can see the trend uh, of increasing vulnerability. Here, um, the association between heat waves and non-accidental mortality in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, and you can see the relative risk uh, uh, elevated above one, uh, particularly in Sydney and in Melbourne, which are, of course, our largest cities. And then the impacts uh, on labour productivity uh, through occupational health. Uh, pathways. And you can see that over this 20 year period, uh, the hours of labour lost and that, that dotted line in the middle, the overall trend, although there's clearly a lot of variability year to year there. And then uh, Aedes aegypti uh, vectorial capacity for Australia uh, compared uh, to other countries in this context, Israel and Panama. Again, you can see uh, a trend over time uh, with anticipated increases into the future. It's important also to, uh, for the health system to get its own health in order. So I've been talking about health impacts of climate change, but we also need to think 
about the impacts of the healthcare system on our climate. And this work led from uh, Manfred Lenz and Aaron Ema Malek's group at uh, the University of Sydney in collaboration with Forbes McGain here in Melbourne was the first assessment of the carbon footprint of Australian healthcare and demonstrated that 7% of Australia's total carbon emissions are attributable to the work of the healthcare system. Uh, to give a sense of comparison here, that's about the equivalent of all of the emissions for the state of South Australia. So uh, we need to pay attention to the way we do our work and to strive to reduce our carbon emissions. In the UK, uh, you may be aware that the NHS has now set an objective of being at the first net zero uh, health system in the world. Uh, we should be doing that in Australia. And then uh, this further piece uh, of work, uh, again, from the same group at the University of Sydney, but looking at broader environmental consequences of healthcare. Carbon emissions, part of the issue, but there's also toxic emissions uh, from the burning of gas, for example, uh, in hospitals, particulate matter, uh, and the impacts on water uh, and water use, uh, scarce water uh, in many contexts. So we have to think broadly about the, the environmental impacts of healthcare. It's worth noting that our National Health and Medical Research Council has now identified resilience uh, to environmental change and emerging health threats uh, and emergencies as a, a, re a strategic research priority uh, for the council. Uh, it first did this in 2017, and there was recently a call for a special initiative. But this, um, this broader strategic approach is intended to focus on three broad components health impacts of environmental change and evaluation of adaptation strategies, understanding the health co-benefits from actions to mitigate environmental change, because we can see health benefits from these transitions, less toxic emissions as well as carbon emissions from energy, uh, uh, sustainable urban systems, good for health and less carbon emissions, similarly with agri-food systems. And then, as I said, uh, the health system itself. Excuse me for interrupting, but just one minute, one minute yeah. more, if that's no. okay. Thanks very much, Melissa. And there's just one, uh, one more slide uh, with a general point and then a final summary slide. So um, a case before the federal court is worth mentioning in this context, uh, Sharma versus the Minister for Environment, Anjali Sharma, a 16-year-old uh, student from Victoria, uh, taken the Australian Minister for Environment to court, arguing that uh, she has a duty of care in decisions about expansion of coal mine in northern New South Wales. And uh, I was pleased to provide the health evidence there. So this health evidence being used uh, in the courts now as well, we're awaiting the outcome of that case. So key messages finally, uh, climate change has already affected in the health of Australian people. The MJA Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change is a world first nationally downscaled collaboration to track progress. Australian health researchers have had long standing concerns, but limited capacity now being addressed by NH and MRC. Back to you, Melissa. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tony, for that comprehensive update. Now to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Fiona Armstrong will be talking on the current gaps in climate and health policy, the current work happening in this space and the policy asks by the health sector. Fiona is founder and executive director of Climate and Health Alliance, whose mission is to build a powerful health sector movement for climate action. She is the architect of the world's first framework for a national strategy on climate, health and wellbeing for Australia 2017, and the lead author of the Queensland Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Change Adaptation Plan from 2018. Fiona recently conceived and led the Rewrite the Future Roundtable series, which led to the publication, Australia in 2030, Possible Alternative Futures. And she is the lead author of the accompanying 
healthy, regenerative and just policy agenda. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, thanks to Tony, to Uncle Ray, um, Melissa and to Lisa. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri land here in Melbourne, um, land that was stolen and never ceded. And to say that at Climate and Health Alliance, we're working to listen and learn from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about how we can better reflect Indigenous cultural knowledge and practice developed over millennia around health, uh, regarding health and well-being and caring for country um, and re reflecting that in our work and our advocacy. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the work done by, by my colleague Millie Burgess in organising this event and thank Lisa for her leadership in the Better Futures Australia initiative and to my colleagues in the health sector working group. So as we've heard from Tony, um, the implications for health from climate change are profound. And this slide shows how quickly we must act if there is any chance to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees. Increasingly, we're hearing that that um, goal may be unattainable, but the um, recent report as uh, that Tony's referred to in Lancet Countdown, making it clear um, that the next five years are absolutely critical. It's clear that the world must act more quickly on climate change, um, and this slide showing the pathway to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, depending on where we start. Um, you can see on the, the left, the, um, the black line, our emissions over time, and the yellow line showing where we might have, uh, the trajectory we might have had, had we started in 2000. But now in 2020 and, um, and throughout the next decade, the emissions trajectory becomes increasingly steep uh, the longer we delay. Um, Australia is, despite what we hear, um, a laggard when it comes to acting on climate change. And that is, as the MJA Lancet Countdown has pointed out, costing lives in Australia and globally. Next slide, please, Millie. Um, so this slide here, the WHO um, acknowledging the profound health consequences of climate change and highlighting that there is very strong agreement that the world must realise the goals of the, the Paris Agreement if we are to avoid a long and accelerating public health emergency associated with climate change. And the way in which WHO talks about, WHO talks about it is that the Paris Health Agreement is an, a profoundly important public health agreement. Next slide, please. The health sector can and must lead on climate solutions advocacy and action. We are a huge sector, the health and social sector, the largest employer in Australia, a huge proportion of GDP. Um, we can lead on solutions and we have. This framework developed by the health sector um, following extensive consultation in 2016 and 17, providing a comprehensive guide for governments, the health sector, for business and industry and the community to support Australia to recognise, manage and respond to the health risks of climate change and promote health through climate action. If implemented, this a national strategy um, using this framework would help Australia meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement. Um, it provides a framework um, against which we can demonstrate progress against the Lancet countdown indicators and it will assist us in meeting the sustainable development goals. It was a policy position of the Australian Labor Party from 2017 to 19. Uh, they reconfirmed that commitment in 2020 in the um, Eden Monaro by-election, but it is yet to be reconfirmed under Chris Bowen as the new shadow health minister um, so we all have more work to do to make sure that it, be, it again becomes a locked in policy commitment for them. Next slide, please, Millie. Um, there is a lot of agreement about the solutions that are required and these organisations involved in the development of the framework, which has been endorsed by many more organisations since it was first released. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the call for a national strategy on climate health and well-being is now a key ask of the Australian Medical Association and the Royal Australian College of Physicians. And thanks to those organisations for their leadership in this space. Um, in this slide, you can see it's being recognised in the peer-reviewed literature as a key policy solution being advanced um, in the Lancet Countdown Medical Journal of Australia Policy Brief, which is produced annually alongside the Lancet Countdown. Next slide, please. There's a lot of advocacy in the health community globally, um, and this has only accelerated during, during COVID-19. Um, on the left of this slide, you can see a call to action from over 350 organisations globally, representing 40 million health professionals, calling for a healthy green recovery to COVID-19. Um, and this reflects and endorses the WHO manifesto for a healthy green recovery, also released in 2020, and which reflects the WHO advocacy in the lead up to COP26, the 26th conference of the parties um, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that will be held in Glasgow in November this year. Next slide, please. Um, and here in Australia, this advocacy has taken the form of a, the policy agenda produced through consultation with experts and thought leaders in 2020, calling for action to realise a healthy, regenerative and just future and which builds on the framework for a national strategy and adds an eighth area to this prior seven areas of policy action of thriving ecosystems. Next slide, please. There's also a lot of leadership within the health sector to decarbonise healthcare and strengthen climate resilience through the hundreds of thousands of hospitals and health services globally that are involved in the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network which includes the NHS SDU, as Tony has said, which has such an um, ambitious target and is an inspiration to us all. Next slide, please. However, as this call to action makes clear, the consequences of failing to act are dire and the actions of governments to date have been manifestly inadequate. The federal government must act to support this agenda. Next slide, please. So we must use our influence um, in the health and medical sector to encourage them to do so. Um, so doing this as part of a collaborative um, effort across the health sector is critical. Being part of a broader multi-sector effort, such as the Better Futures Australia initiative is also vital. The solutions don't exist in just one sector, nor can one constituency provide the political cover that's required to achieve action on climate change in Australia. Acting together, however, can provide a mandate for action. So I want to thank you all for your participation in this event today. Um, I look forward to working with you all and um, to advancing this agenda following this event with our open letter to Prime Minister Scott Morrison and subsequent um, actions together um, following on from that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona, for that energising presentation. Next, we will hear from climate health leaders who will showcase the climate work happening in their organisations. First up is Kate Loxton, the Chair of Sydney North Health Network. Kate works in primary health care as an occupational therapist. Throughout her career, she has worked to build an efficient primary health care network to improve health and quality of life. In response to the World Health Organization's declaration that climate change is the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century, the Sydney North Health Network launched a climate and health strategy to guide us to consider the impact of climate on health in all our operational policies, procedures and decisions. Thank you very much, Kate. Hi, everybody. I'm just not too sure if my slides are showing. Can someone just let me know? Sorry. No, we can't see them yet, Kate. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, 
Would you like me to share them for you? Um, yes, please. Maybe that would be okay, great. Maybe if you just get started and I will um, get them up in a second. Okay. Actually, yeah. okay, thank you everyone for having me here today. And I would also like to acknowledge the media on Aboriginal land and really thank Australia's First People for looking after our land, air and water for over 70,000 years. So as we're hearing, um, the World Health Organization has warned us that climate change represents the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. And an article published in The Lancet in 2018 revealed 70% of Australia's carbon emissions came from the health care. Kate, I'm very sorry to interrupt. It's Melissa here, but could, could we ask you to speak up a little bit? I think some of us are having trouble hearing. Okay, sorry about that. Or maybe there's a volume issue. Um, I did have volume. I did have a whole mic issue. I've just set up another mic. Um, so... Um, so the Lancet um, article in 2018 revealed 7% of Australia's carbon emissions came from healthcare, with public and private hospitals contributing to 44% of that. So we see primary health networks being in a great position to influence and generate change that will lead to health being delivered with a lower carbon emission. Our strategy is twofold. Firstly, to reduce the carbon emissions generated by the delivery of health care and, of course, to support the primary health care workers in times of severe weather-related events. The more services that, we can, that can be provided in the community, the lower the carbon footprint will be. This requires us to educate the primary health care workforce and get their buy-in and commitment to reduce their individual carbon emissions and and a change to the way our current health services are delivered. We need more health services provided in the community as it comes at a lower per capita cost and with a much lower carbon footprint. So our climate and health strategy is a first step to embedding climate change and health as a consideration in everything we do. Next slide, please. We know that the impact climate-related weather events have on our health, direct consequences such as the respiratory ailments um, following bushfires and the poor air quality, and also the indirect consequences such as people experience, experiencing deteriorating mental health after living through an extreme weather event. But we're not just talking about extreme weather events impacting on our health, but also the increase in respiratory and other health ailments caused by poor air pollution even short-term exposure to the, to the particulate matter in polluted air has been associated with an increased risk of hospitalisation. Small changes to the way primary health care is delivered can reduce the overall carbon emissions created by our current models of health care delivery. Primary health networks are in a position to educate GPs and other primary health care providers to raise their awareness to the extent of the problem encouraging them to change the way they do things to reproduce their carbon footprint. We're also in a position to work with other agencies and health providers to transform health systems. Any change to the way we currently do things needs to be considered through a climate and health lens. So how did we get started? Um, Millie, can you just, are you, have you got the slide aligning our climate and health strategy for our strategic planner? So how we got is the table. So how we got started was by aligning our climate and health strategy to our organisational strategy itself. So everything we do is aligned with our with our organisation strategy. So we've got five goals and all of our related climate goals um, align with our, with our strategic plan. So it's very much in alignment. So anything we do um, is, 
is in line with our strategy. So you can see the table, we've got our uh, goals for our strategic plan, and then we've got our climate and health strategy goals that align against the community activation, system transformation, commissioning, member and, and provider support. So where have we got to as a primary health network since launching our strategy in 2000 and 2020? We've been faced with bushfires, floods, and then the COVID pandemic since we launched our strategy. So a huge part of our attention has been in supporting our primary health care, care workers to safely diagnose COVID and to provide early intervention, which in turn kept people out of hospital and impacted positively on the control of the disease. COVID has given us the chance to engage with relevant parties and bring climate and health to the forefront of our agenda. The bushfires and the pandemic has led to greater appreciation of the role of primary health care plays in the event of emergencies. GPs have become involved in the preparation of emergency response plans in the community. In particular, they've been working with our RACFs to develop their emergency response plans. We have commenced collaboration with our local health district to reshape how services are delivered. We're in very early stages, but there is a realisation starting to be recognised that many health services can be delivered in the community at a lower per capita cost and with lower carbon emissions, leading the hospitals to attend to health care needs that need the acute care that hospitals provide so very well. This, however, as we all know, is so much more complicated than it sounds due to the state and federal funding schemes. But we believe we are leading by example. Everything we do is through a climate and health lens. Already we have changed the way we do many things internally. Primary health networks can and will play an instrumental role in reshaping how health is delivered at the right time and in the right place with lower per capita rates and lower carbon emissions leading to a healthier world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Terrific to hear about that work. Now we will hear from Dr. Eugenie Kayak, a Melbourne-based public and private anaesthetist. She's the convener of Doctors for the Environment Australia's National Sustainable Healthcare Special Interest Group. She is past DEA co-chair and board member, during which time she represented and led DEA's work on multiple initiatives. For over a decade, Eugenie has presented, taught, and contributed to numerous documents and sustainable healthcare publications, including DEA's Net Zero Emissions, Responsibilities, Pathways, and Opportunities for Australia's Healthcare Sector Report, and also the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists Statement on Environmental Sustainability in Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. She has worked with DEA and the wider health profession to raise awareness of and address healthcare's environmental impact. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And hopefully you can hear me okay there. Um, thanks to all. And it's a great honor to be um, speaking today and to be representing Doctors for the Environment Australia. For those of you who don't know, we're an organization of doctors and medical students across the nation. And um, we're predominantly, we're all volunteers and supported by our great staff in our office in Melbourne. I'd also like to acknowledge the, that I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And just take a moment to really um, reflect on their true stewardship of our land for millennia. There's so much that we could learn um, through um, their actions and beliefs in our land and appreciation that we only have one earth because we only have one globe and there is no planet B. And DA's vision is healthy planet, healthy people because of that. Our mission is protecting health through care of the environment. As we all, I think, here are absolutely aware, health is inextricably linked to healthy, stable, productive environments. And DA has been working to that mission for two decades now. In fact, this week is our 20th anniversary. We do that in multiple ways. 
go in multiple ways. Um, we raise awareness and we do direct advocacy work. As doctors and the health profession more generally, I think we're really in a unique place to translate the evidence and influence across political, social, economic, and even ideological barriers. And that's what DA aims to do. Our education work is um, very varied. It results or um, means that we speak at many seminars, medical school events, and also provide resources and information within our fact sheets, submissions, proposals, and also position statements. DA over the last two decades has submitted to countless Senate inquiries and also presented at them, particularly when we feel that health is being threatened by um, proposed developments, whether that be due to local health impacts or more globally from greenhouse gas emissions. We're also very active within all sorts of media and publications, both um, in the general media and scientific publications. So this all results in us influencing, hopefully, policymakers, our own medical profession, the general public. We join in on campaigns by assisting others and campaigning with others and doing things ourselves. And um, lead to mobilisation of the medical profession and more widely. Specifically over um, the years, um, education has been core DEA work. We have an annual conference that's been going for over 10 years and generally um, results in several hundred people attending. Of more recent education of, um, initiatives for DEA include our after hours webinar series about climate and health which is a new and exciting initiative for us and accredited by the Colleges of GP and Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. We also have a relatively new podcast series that's been developed by some of our younger, inspiring members, and I highly recommend you to um, have a look at that. Oh, I'll just go back. So DA, climate change has obviously been core DA work for over or two decades now, though we also act and work in the spaces of air pollution, fossil fuel developments and their health impacts, diversity, divestment, biodiversity and ecosystems, and obviously greening healthcare. Just as a little example of what DA did almost 15 years ago um, with others, on the left we have a poster that was developed with the federal AMA back in 2006 and delivered to over 20,000 GP clinics. Global warming, good for mosquitoes, bad for your health. That was in 2006 and in 2008, um, DA worked with the Climate Institute and published Climate Change Health Check 2020 with the late Tony McMichael and Graham Horton. Eugenie, ap apologies for interrupting, but if I could just give you one minute notice, please. That's already, okay. Um, this report was quite ominous in the health threats that it predicted would um, be amongst us in 2020, particularly the heat related health threats. I'm just gonna quickly go over then. Um, Obviously, climate change has been our core business, though the root cause of a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions is coal, and DA has spoken out over the last decade when others maybe have been restrained or unable to. This is a MJA article and the front page in 2011, and also another post that the DA sent to over 20,000 GP clinics in 2011. We've worked on other campaigns, such as raising awareness of um, protecting children's health through action on climate change, which resulted in a pledge um, being delivered to Greg Hunt and others in Canberra in 2019, and bringing together the medical profession to work towards a healthy recovery in the year of COVID in 2020. Because obviously, the recovery from one health emergency, that being COVID, can't be allowed to exacerbate our other health emergency, being climate change, which is very real and very present. We've squandered the last decade 
And this is just a slight example of some of the medical organisations um, around the world and in Australia that have declared a climate as a health emergency. And I know many of your organisations will have done so as well. But obviously, as Tony and others have hinted on, the health profession itself leads to significant greenhouse gas emissions. And we need to lead by example by ensuring we get our own house in order. The healthcare system can't afford to be a contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions. And last year, DA published this report, Net Zero Carbon Emissions, outlining how the Australian healthcare sector needed to and could um, reduce its carbon footprint over the next decade. We're calling for a mission reduction target of 80% by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2040. And in that includes scope one, two and three emissions. And we're hoping that many others will come along and support these emission reduction targets as the AMA and the um, Victorian branch of Australian Nurses and Midwife Federation have. We have several recommendations, but our first one is the necessity of a national sustainable health care unit. Because unless we have some leadership and coordination of metrics, innovation and improvement, then actual real significant reductions over the next decade is probably going to be limited. I'm very sorry, Eugenie, but we'll probably have to run this slide, actually. Um, so I'll just bring your attention to a letter that was in the MJA last year by DEA members, just highlighting why we need a, a national sustainable health care unit and a roadmap to get us there. Obviously, many are doing amazing work in their own workplaces and the Global Green and Healthy Hospital Scheme is helping with that. But healthcare itself needs to be part of the solution, not the problem, and we can have significant influence by our reach if we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugenie. It's fantastic to hear the DEA working on so many fronts. Now we will hear from Dr. Ramsey Awab, Executive Director, Infrastructure Planning and Sustainability, who is responsible for managing and delivering clinical planning, capital works, engineering, maintenance and sustainability for the Hunter New England Health District, leading the district's sustainable healthcare initiative towards zero 2030 Ramsey is committed to displaying public leadership, making positive economic, social and environmental impacts for future generations. Thank you so much. Well, I sound very impressive. I've never, um, that's lovely. I'm going to have to write that down, Mel. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I've got five minutes, I understand. Is that right? Um, I've got a little presentation to share with you. Has that come up for you? Great. Okay, I'll, I'll kick off. So um, thanks for having me, guys. Very much appreciate it. I'm going to take you through a strategy um, that we launched um, a couple of months ago now, um, which is um, taking our health district. If you don't know, Hunter New England Health is the biggest health district in New South Wales, one of the biggest in the country. We span the geographical area of the United Kingdom. We have an operating budget of about two and a half billion dollars, 100 facilities and 16,000 staff. We have the busiest um, trauma centre in, um, in the country as well at the John Hunter Hospital. Um, so this is a big initiative for us. Um, our vision, and I've got five minutes, I'm aware, so I'll move very quickly and you're only getting a, a really high level um, snapshot of what we're doing. But in terms of the vision, the headline is we are going to be carbon and waste neutral by 2030. We, um, and this point is important, we're reducing our impact um, on the sustainability, but we're not taking away any funding for frontline clinical services. We didn't want to set ourselves up into a position where we're making decisions about getting a new nurse or a new doctor versus investing in sustainability. So that has been really helpful for us because every initiative that we've put in place actually saves us money or um, breaks even. The last element is, as the biggest employer in the region, we have an opportunity to um, drive, um, become public leaders in this particular space and drive a change in a lot of our um, suppliers because um, we buy lots of stuff here at hospitals. 
Um, so our, um, the rationale, I think you've already covered in a number of your other presentations about our impact, so I'm not going to cover that. In terms of our goals now, we are publicly saying this. We have a video that supports and outlines our strategy, which I'm sure we can share. Um, but we are saying there is a connection between human health and the environment. We are saying we want to eliminate our contribution to that, by all, but also be fiscally responsible and understand what our core business is which is delivering healthcare. We um, are adopting some Aboriginal stewardship values. So they call it caring for country. We're working with some of the Aboriginal communities here to actually achieve that. Importantly, we're engaging um, and empowering, as it says there, our staff to participate. Um, we all know that look, to, to drop our CO2 emissions, we just need green energy. Um, and if we, if we had um, electricity being provided by a green provider, we'd, we'd come close to meeting our targets. But what we want to try to do is build a movement as well. So I'll, um, we have over 150 staff who are running small initiatives in their particular areas um, to uh, drive small sustainability um, projects, um, be it in theatres or in administrative areas and so forth. So they're participating in that um, work so we can build a movement. So they go home and talk to their family and friends and so forth about what they're doing. So these are our targets, 100,000 tonnes to zero tonnes by 2030 in terms of CO2. Rainwater, we only capture 5%. We're going to move to 100% with that. Um, recycled water, only 1% at the moment. We're going to move to 50%. Um, and we need to do that because we still, we're still going to have to wash our hands and flush toilets in our hospitals. So it'll never be 100%. 80% of our waste at the moment goes to landfill and we want that to be zero. Um, the bit I wanted just to spend another minute talking, I know there's a minute left, but our approach, um, there's a few elements and this comes back to what do you need to actually put in place to drive a strategy like this? One is presenting that case for change, explaining to your staff and the community why you're doing that. That's why we have the video in this presentation. We've established some goals for us, stretch targets for us to achieve, um, and we've got performance measures and targets in place for that. We've got a quite a robust data reporting and collection process now where we can track how we're going. We've got a governance structure which cascades from the board through down to unit level. We've got reward and recognition set up in our Hunter Health Awards around sustainability each year. We've established communities of interest from um, being on global um, communities of interest, which we participate in, all the way through to connecting the theatres in Tamworth with the theatres in um, John Hunter talking about their initiatives. And finally, we've got leadership by way of um, me being an executive with sustainability in their title, um, but also resources like Alyssa where, and other people that are part of our team where we drive innovation and change and focus on that. Um, these are our six key areas that we're driving forward with. Um, we've got a whole raft of initiatives. I know my five minutes is up. Mel, if you wanted to give me an extra 60 seconds, I'd tell you about some of our bigger initiatives, but if not, I can pause there. Oh, that's a, that's a hard call, mate. Call. I know, so yeah, I put, a, put it back to you. <laughs> I'm just conscious that we're running over time as we are. I could I ask you to write about it in the chat? Would that? Would that be all right? And that way we can all see what you have to sure. say. Sure, Alyssa, Alyssa can drop in a few things. We have the largest solar panel installation on any hospital in the country. We're recycling all our renal dialysis water. There are a couple of the big things. Fantastic. It's so good to hear about this work underway. Now